Last Wednesday we talked about uh, is your soul prosperous? Is your soul prosperous? This morning I talk about the dangers of atrophy. The dangers of atrophy. Just have seven small verses, and notice let's begin by reading verse number eight together. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Uh, these talking about the believers, the brethren that have come in this church, whether Gaius was the pastor or not, these believers have come, and these strangers have come to this church, and he says we ought to receive such, the brethren and strangers. Not turn them away, but receive them. What was the purpose of receiving them? That we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Help those strangers, help those brethren that have come to visit when the truth. Now notice the truth. That's the Bible. Not just any old Bible. It's the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words that underline our King James Bible. The King James Bible is the accurate translation in English of those words. That's the truth. Fellow helpers to the truth. How much are you helping this truth? How much am I helping this truth? We trust that to be the case. We're glad for Dr. Uh, Dr. Young there in, uh, in Korea, who has got a Bible that's faithful to the truth, faithful to the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words in Korean. We're glad for uh, Pastor Dr. Gomez in Spanish, faithful translation in Spanish, but fellow helpers to the truth. I want to look, I want to look now at some of the different verses that have used this word fellow helpers. See, it's not just the preachers, not just a couple of people in churches. We all have got to help the Lord's work. For instance, in Matthew 18, 28, the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, and uh, so on and so forth. Fellow servant, that's the same word here. In John 11, verse 16, uh, Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, said, Let us go that we may die with him. What a liar Thomas was. He was even pres present in the second Sunday evening service. The first Sunday evening service, right? He in the second one. And here was a big mouth, let's go that we may die with the Lord Jesus. That's Thomas, the apostle. Then in Romans 16, 7, slew Andronicus and Julia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners. Here's a fellow prisoner in Rome who are of note among the apostles that were in Christ before me. Then in 2 Corinthians 8, 23, uh, Titus, my partner and fellow helper. See, these are helpers with us. One person can't do it all. Everybody's got to help in the ministry. And Titus was one. In Ephesians 2.19, you're no more strangers and foreigners if you're saved and born again. But fellow citizens. There's another fellow citizens with the saints and household of God. In Ephesians 3 and verse 5, that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs. There's another fellow, joint heirs, joint prisoners, joint helpers, and as fellow helpers in this verse number 8. The same body. In Philippians 2.25, talks about Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier. We've got to be a fellow soldier for the Lord, fighting the battles for the faith. In Philippians 4 and verse 3, talks about Clement. Also, with the other, my fellow laborers, whose names are written in the book of life. Fellows, companionship is necessary indeed. And then in Colossians 1 and verse 7, Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, uh, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Uh, Pastor Dan, there's a little blue thing. Is that okay on the screen there? Back, is that okay? Is that indicating anything? It's, it's, it's the, that, this has to change, whichever one is oh, that. Okay. You have to, you have to have display to see how this is supposed to be. The backup disc has to be backup changed. backup disc has to be changed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then so. Colossians that's 4 that's and verse 7, it's mentioned Tychicus, oh, declaring to you as a beloved brother, fellow servant, and Lord, fellow servant. So there's fellow people helping. And then Colossians 4 and verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Again, a fellow prisoner. In Colossians 4 verse 11, uh, uh, Jesus called justice only my fellow workers in the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Uh, fellow workers, fellow prisoners, fellow laborers. And then in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2, uh, send Timotheus. He's called my brother, a minister of God, and our fellow laborer, the gospel of Christ. Paul mentioned many times Timothy as a fellow worker, fellow laborer. I hope all of you who are here in our service that can be fellow workers for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philemon 1, and verse 2, uh, it talks about Philemon, our dear beloved and fellow laborer. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our, our, our fellow soldiers. So fellow laborers, fellow soldiers. In Philemon 23, 
Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So here's more that are helpers along with the main people. Revelation 6 and verse 11. That they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Fellow servants in the book of Revelation that one day will be slaughtered and killed, saved people by the Antichrist will be slain. And then in Revelation 19 and verse 10, uh, John says, I fell at his feet to worship him, the angel. He said unto me, See thou do it not. I am a fellow servant and of thy brethren. And so all these different fellow laborers, fellow servants, helpers, and so we might be fellow helpers, as it says in verse 8, is the truth. Nobody can do it all themselves. We've got to help each other standing for the truth of the Word of God. Let's read verse number 9 together. I wrote unto the church, but the atrophies, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receive us not. Now whether this is Gaius, who is the president pastor of the church, but Paul, or rather, John the Apostle wrote to this church, this local church of Bradley, and then this man Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Diotrephes didn't want anything to do with the Apostle John, apparently, and nor probably too much with Gaius if he was the pastor of that church. Uh, they receive us not. That word, uh, Diotrephes, uh, it means it's a, he's one of the proud, arrogant Christians that are mentioned. But let's none of us be proud and arrogant. Let's be strong in the faith, but not proud and arrogant as Diotrephes was. That's why I titled the message, uh, No Diotrephes, Don't Be a Diotrephes, uh, The Dangers of Diotrephes. That word that is used of him, who loveth to have the preeminence among them. Loveth to have the preeminence. That word is an interesting word. It is philo proteo. Philo is love and proteo is first. Proto, the prototype. First. It's a present tense. He continuously wants to be first in this church. Nobody's going to be, beat him. He's got to be top dog, as they say, of all the people in that church. And the meaning of that is to aspire to preeminence, to desire to be first. And that was his problem. That was Diotrephes' problem, uh, exalting himself and having a preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Didn't receive John the Apostle, probably didn't receive Gaius the pastor. <clears throat> I want to look at some verses that have to do with preeminence and exaltation. There are two things about exaltation. Number one, the Lord Jesus should be exalted in all of our activities, all of our life, the Word of God, but ourselves should be submissive and not exalted. So let's look at a few of these verses. For instance, in Colossians 1.18, uh, He, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. By the way, the body, the church, which is His body, all saved, born again Christians are in that body, not just some little Baptist church that's in Connecticut or some other place, but the church, the body of the church, the Lord Jesus is the head of that body, the believers of all kinds, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's where it ought to be. Not in any person, any individual, not in the atrophies or anybody else, in our church or any other church. The Lord Jesus should be first. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the first verses on exalting either the Lord or exalting ourselves. In Exodus 9.17, for example, As yet exaltest thou, that is Pharaoh, thyself against thy pe my people, that thou wilt not let them go? Uh, Pharaoh was exalting himself and forbade the people to leave. We've been reading in the book of Exodus these last couple of days in our Bible reading. And uh, he says no. First he says yes, I'll let you go. Then he lied. He didn't keep his promise. In Exodus 15 and verse 2, the Lord is my strength and my song. This is the David's or, or the song of Moses. And he has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him in habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. Not a man, not a person, but exalting the Lord. That's a proper exaltation. In 2 Samuel 22 and verse 47, Samuel said, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my, my king, David, King David, my rock, and exalted the God of the rock of my salvation. 
David exalted the Lord himself and the God of his salvation, which should be exalted. And in 1 Kings 1 5, we see something that's against exaltation. His Adonai, Adonijah. He's the one that rose up to try to kill David and, and take the kingdom for himself and be the king. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself. We don't have to exalt ourselves. We should humble ourselves in the mighty hand of God that he will raise us up. And Adonijah said, I will be king. He prepared him chariots and horsemen, 50 men to run before him. He didn't win. He tried to exalt himself. As the Atrophies tried to exalt himself in this book of 3 John. In Psalm 12 and verse 8, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Mark it down. When you exalt vile men, wicked are all around. We have that today, do we not, in this country and all over the world. In Psalm 21, verse 13, David says, Be thou exalted, O Lord. Be thou, that's the one to exalt and lift up high above all the rest. In Psalm 34, verse 3, O magnify the Lord with me. Here's your fellow magnifiers. Hey, magnify the Lord with me. And we know the rest of it. And let, let us, us exalt, exalt his, his name, name together. together. That's right. Exalt his name together. Then in Psalm 66 and verse 7. He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Notice this. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Rebellious. We have it all over the place in our country today, don't we? Exalting themselves. I'm number one. Who cares about the legislator? or the judicial executive exalted. In Isaiah 14, verse 12, we see Lucifer, the devil himself. Uh, God says in Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, people, a lot of people don't like that word Lucifer. They say, oh, there's some other morning star. No, Lucifer is a good term. Uh, Halal is a Hebrew word. It means shining one, shining one. That's what Lucifer means. It's from two Latin words. Loose as lux for, for light, and pharaoh from to carry, to bear, and a light bearer. It's a good word, it's a Latin word. Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Notice what Lucifer, Satan's problem was. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Exalting himself led to his demise and cast down from the highest place in heaven. No longer is he Lucifer the mighty, but he's down, cast down as the devil himself. And then in Daniel 11 and verse 36, talking about the king who is the Antichrist, shall do according to his will, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Now in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, He'll seem so wonderful, so fine, so kind. Oh, let's follow him. The last three and a half years, his colors will show forth very clearly who he is and what he is. He will exalt himself above every god. He shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. He'll blaspheme our God of, of the heaven and earth. Then in Matthew 23, verse 12, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus' words here about exaltation, Whosoever shall exalt himself, so be abased, brought right down to nothing. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Let the Lord be the one to exalt. In Philippians 2, 9, <clears throat> it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ after the bodily resurrection of our Savior. God also hath highly exalted him. The Lord Jesus is to be exalted above all, the preeminent one, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Then in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, uh, this is a picture of what's going to take place in the tribulation period. A lot of people wonder, what about this Antichrist? Should we accept him? Should we not accept him? Paul says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there first come a falling away first, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and that exalteth himself above all that is called God. He exalts himself. He's an exalter of self, just like the atrophies. 
above God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And some people are saying, about certain people in the United States of America, mm -hmm. almost like they're God. It's, that's about it. Uh, and Messiah and all these other things. And then in First Peter, the last verse we want to talk about in this exaltation, First Peter 5 and verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hands of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You say, well, he hasn't exalted me yet. Well, it's not due time. Just wait a while. In due time, God, if he wants to exalt us, he will be the one to do it. Let's read verse number 10 together. Wherefore, if I come, I remember his seeds, which he doeth, praying against us the malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. <laughs> Talking about the atrophies, what a person this one is. Uh, and I know in other churches where we've been, uh, the people that have left the church, that split up for some reason, they come over to the other church, and a lot of times the people in that church that they come to don't want them. Because they say, oh, they're going to run us. We can't do ourselves. We can't be the big cheese, you see. And so they're against these people coming from other churches. We've seen it. In fact, uh, we saw it ourselves when we went from one church back to the other church, and people looked at us. Oh, you people, you came from that other place? Uh, they don't want us. No, this is, this is sad. People don't want us many times because they want to be the big exalted people in their church. They don't want anybody else to, to have anything to do with them. I want you to notice four things that Diotrephes did in this verse number 10. The first, he prayed it against us. This Apostle John probably gave us the pastor with malicious words. And the second thing, not content therewith, neither did he himself receive the brethren. He didn't receive these strangers and brethren. Came for these. He didn't receive them. Second thing. Uh, third, he forbids them that would receive them. People in the church says, well, no, we must have, they're fine, they're born again Christians, receive them. He forbids those that want to receive them. And number four, casteth them out of the church. Those that want to receive these, get out. He just excommunicates these people. Sad, indeed, it is. Now this word, uh, prating, it's an interesting word, is floreratwa. It means to, to utter nonsense. To utter nonsense against them. Speak against them. That's right, I don't know it says, to talk idly. That's what it means, to bring forward idle accusations. Not true, not just false things. Make empty charges. To accuse one falsely with malicious words. That's what he did, prating with malicious, hateful words. Not content with that, uh, but didn't want to receive the brethren, forbids them, they want to. With malice. Many verses on malice. This man, Diotrephes, was malicious indeed. In Romans 1, 29, for example, uh, talked about the unsaved early world, uh, the unsaved people all over the world, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Filled with it, all that unsaved early world. <coughs> Hateful murder, debate, and so on. Then in Ephesians 4, and verse 34, uh, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, but all bitterness, and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, be put away with you with all malice. With all malice. Hatred in advance. Then in Colossians 3 and verse 8, And now you also put off all these, things that were to put off. Those who were genuinely saved should drop off these things. They're listed. Anger, wrath. The third thing is malice as well as blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. We're to put those things off. We're to just divest ourselves of these things once we're born again and saved. And then in 1 Peter 2, in verse 1, the Apostle Peter says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, all evil speakings. Some of the things we're to lay aside, and uh, not diatrophies. He would take the... Apostle John and take Gaius, who was maybe the pastor of that church, and uh, he would just, with malicious words, idle words, false words, false charges, ridicule and cast them out. 
that word for cast out is ek It means to cast out, drive out, uh, the notion of with violence. He wouldn't just say, no, I'd like you to leave. Get out, he'd probably have a couple of armed people to take him out. With violence, ek to cast out. Let's read verse number 11 together. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, and he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now this is the present prohibition. And of course, present prohibition is always no, it's stop an action already in progress. It's an heiress prohibition. It's don't even begin to do something. This is present tense. Stop following. Stop that action. That which is evil. Apparently, Apostle John saw many people in this local church that were following evil. But follow that which is good. Uh, now, what does it mean, evil? How would you know what evil is? The only way you'll know what genuine evil in God's eyes are, it, are is to find it in the Scriptures, the Word of God. God labels what evil is. Not people. People think many things that God calls evil, they say they're good. God calls them evil. We must go to the Word of God. Uh, God is against lying. That's evil. And he's opposed to that, and we should not follow that evil. He's against adultery. We shouldn't have followed adultery. He's opposed to that. He's against fornication. He's against homosexuality, homosexual marriage. All these things are an abomination to the Lord. That's evil. And John says, stop following evil. He's against rape, against stealing, against murder. And one of the murders he's desperately against is the murder of little babies that are unborn, abortions. Almost one and a half million per, per year in this country, plus all over the world. And our president is all for it. In fact, our president, says, even after he comes out of the, the mother's womb, kill him. It's fine. Kill him. And he voted for that killing when he was a senator in Illinois. And so we have murders and he's people that are following evil. And we have no standards anymore in our country. Our standards are gone. The Word of God tells us what he believes is evil. And John says, stop following that which is evil. Follow that which is good. How do we know which is good? Again, the Word of God in the Scriptures. The only place we'll find what's good. The only definition. The world calls it evil. We call it good. It's a horrible thing. The difference in distinctions. But he that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. As far as following things, there's different verses on following. Uh, in Romans 14, 19, for example, Paul says to the church at Rome, Let us follow after the things that make for peace, things that therewith we may edify one another. We're to follow, continue to, after to do that which is good. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 15, uh, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. That's a, that's a normal trend to do, isn't it? Somebody does you evil, you do them evil back. She, she said, No, don't do that. If they do evil to you, don't render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. If people do us evil, we don't do them evil back. See, we, we just hold off and do that which is good. That's not always easy because the flesh always wants to get back, always wants to pay back. Uh, but God says don't follow evil in behalf and for evil, but follow good. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11, Paul talks to Pastor Timothy there at the church at Ephesus. He says, Thou, O man of God, flee these things. In verse 11, the previous verse he's listed a whole bunch of evil things that people are following all around him. He says now, Preacher Timothy, you're a man of God. You flee all of these things. But there's certain things I want you to follow. I want you to keep following. Keep following. The first is righteousness. Again, the standard of righteousness is in the Scriptures, the Word of God. He wants to follow godliness. Not worldliness, but godliness. I want you to follow faith. Faith in the Savior. Faith in the Word of God. I want you to follow love. Love for the brethren. Godly love. I want you to follow patience. And that's not easy either. Patience. Uh, you have need of patience. And we know in Scripture it says, Tribulation worketh patience. And if we don't have patience and tribulation, we're in serious trouble. And we've said many times before, I don't want to use it again, but I want to say it again. In the dental chair, when you're being drilled, for one reason or another, it takes patience 
to wait till the drilling is finished and you can quietly leave the chair and get out of there. Patience. I say that over here, but to me that's that's very important because uh, I went to Dennis, we go every six months, I guess something like that. He calls us up and uh, releases the card, and so I guess it's all right for the insurance. Every six months he'll be able to be pretty well free. Well, this time I went in there. See, normally he looked in there and said, well, I have no business with you. You're all clean. He sends me out. This time, I said, there's a little hole here. So, all right, I'll fix it. And he found another hole. He got two of them. Anyway, the first one was so slight, he didn't, didn't have to uh, drill anything. But the second one, he had to dug it. Anyway, we have need of patience, all of us. Patience. And, and also, yes, I was very patient. I, I learned patience by the tribulations that had in the channel chat and other places. But uh, also, meekness. Uh, follow after meekness. Now, that doesn't mean just like a baby, no stalwartness, no standing for the things of the Word of God, but do it in such a way. Uh, sometimes they've illustrated this. Uh, the iron fist in a velvet glove. Iron fist in a velvet glove. See, you got the iron behind you, too, but make it a velvet, nice, quiet appearance of meekness. It's not weakness. Lord Jesus was meek and humble, but he was not weak. He drove those money changers out of the temple. They had no business being there, uh, making money out of people's gifts, gifts for the Lord. But he was meek, but he was not weak. He was strong. So that meekness is a trait that's part of the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. If we're following him, if we're controlled by the Spirit of God, and uh, have the fruit of the Spirit. And then in 2 Timothy 2, and verse 22, uh, uh, he says also to Pastor Timothy a second time, I don't know whether Pastor Timothy needed some more admonition, in 1 Timothy told him, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. Now, does that mean you you only have the lust when you're youthful? No, it's called youthful lusts. Can the youthful lust be in older people? Yeah, absolutely. Flee them, whether they're young or old. Flee youthful lusts. But follow. Pastor Timothy, Paul says you've got to follow. Again, he illustrates again righteousness. He said that before. And faith, he said that. Charity, peace. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And then in Hebrews 12 and verse 14, Apostle Paul said, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness. Not that we're holiness people, but we believe that we should walk in a holy manner, in a holy way, so that we would honor the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we do. Now let's read verse number 12 together. Demetrius hath a good report of all men, and of the truth itself, nay, and we also bear record, and he know that our record is true. Alright, uh, now notice Demetrius. What a difference. His name begins with D, just like Diotrephes begins with D. But Diotrephes and Demetrius, totally different. Totally different. Which are we? Demetrius or Diotrephes? It's a good question. Uh, Demetrius, notice what he, he has a good report, something that is honorable and good. But notice two phases of his report. The first is good report of all men, the second of the truth itself. Now, some people may have a good report among people and men as they see us. Oh, what a wonderful thing. But of the truth itself, God's truth measured by the standards of the Word of God, the Bible. That's where a good report also. What is our grade? Oh, the, the people of this world may give us A or A plus before men. Oh, look at them. Even if they're unsaved people, not even born again people. A lot of people say, oh, they're wonderful. Look at their wonderful good report. That's the report card they give to the people, even though they're lost and bound for hell. But a good report in the of truth. What report does God give to us? Is he A plus? Is it B, C, D, E? Or is it a failure? And Demetrius apparently was in both report cards. Good report. May we strive to that same thing. May we strive and not fail until we reach that good report. Not only the punk people, but the truth itself. Many it says, yea, we also. Gaius, the pastor, I'm sure, and Apostle John also bear record. It's Demetrius, and you know our record is true. He was an outstanding man of that church. May you and I be outstanding people in our church and the things of the Lord. Uh, 
good report is used only ten times, but a few times. Here's in Acts chapter 22 and verse 12, for example. Uh, one Ananias, he was the one that helped Paul uh, to recover his blindness, you know. In Acts chapter 9, we were studying that in uh, Thursday Bible study. Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. A good report among these people was Gaius, or Ananias, right? And then in Philippians 4 and verse 8, finally, brother, we know this, we say this together, finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtues, if there be any praise, think on these things. Good report, things of good report were to think on these things. And then in 1 Timothy 3, in verse 7. Again, Paul talks to Pastor Timothy. And he's talking about a pastor, bishop, elder. In 1 Timothy 3, there are regulations for pastors, bishop, elders. One in the same office, three different titles. He says, moreover, he, that is his pastor, bishop, elder, must have, not just a possibility, but desperately must have a good report of them that are without. Those outside of the things of Christ. Those people that are lost and unsafe, he must have a good report. He can't be a thief, he can't be a liar, he can't be a stealer, he can't be all these murderers. And the people who see that man who's supposed to be a pastor, bishop, elder, must have a good report of them that are without. Why? Lest he fall into reproach. And many pastors have fallen into reproach because they don't have good reports of them that are without. I just read an article this last week about the man, what's his name? <laughs> he's got a he's got a big church, huge church in the stadium. Posting. 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 Yeah, Posting. Posting. He's got problems. He's been charged. I don't know the details, but something about stealing funds or stealing money. Something. It's a big old scandal about Osteen. I don't know. He's got probably millions and millions of dollars coming in. Uh, but we must have a good report, lest he fall into reproach. Because in other pastors, you know that, uh, you think of Jack Hiles with the reports that he had with his deacon's wife and, uh, and so on. And then the, the son or the son-in-law, who's a recent fellow, he went off with some woman and, uh, and was, now he's in jail. Uh, no report, good report then without. What a scandal that brings to other pastor bishop elders. To have preachers that are supposed to know the scriptures, they're falling in all sorts of bad reports. And they down all of us. Sad thing indeed. Must have a good report, uh, lest he fall into reports, and the snare of the devil. The devil's snare is part of the thing that preachers, pastor, bishop, elders, the devil wants that pastor, bishop, elder to be snared and fallen away and just absolutely destroyed. And so good reports are necessary for pastor, bishop, elders. Then in Hebrews 11, verse 1 and 2, we know this one, let's have it again. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. By faith, this faith chapter, the hall of faith, as it says in the whole chapter 11, they were, had a good report. That doesn't mean they were rich. That doesn't mean they were well, good looking. Uh, that doesn't mean any of these other things are powerful. But they had faith. And because of their faith in the things of the Lord, faith in God, faith in His words, they had a good report. How is our report card looking? Just think about it. Faith in the things of the Lord. Let's read verse number 13 together. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you. Uh, now this is something interesting. Uh, Anna quoted a verse that I'm going to use this morning. I don't know whether she knew I was going to use it or not, but she quoted it. She said in 2 Corinthians 10, 8 uh, and 9, um, I read 8 before I get to 9. Paul says, though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, he's writing out of Corinthians because, you know, he kicked out that man that had his own uh, father's wife. He was an ancestral person. Uh, more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction. I should not be ashamed. In verse 9, and that's what Anna quoted, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Yes, you go to the next verse, verse 10. Terrify you by letters. And apparently Paul could terrify him because he was very angry about this man. 
get them out of your church. Letters sometimes do terrify. You got to be very careful. I don't know. I think all different. I times, a lot of times, write very, very briefly, very short words, short sentences, and sometimes they're misinterpreted completely. And those people that receive them are angry. I didn't mean any harm. Sometimes people get our letters wrong. They just read into it something that's just terrible. Uh, he doesn't want to terrify them with letters. He's writing out a second Corinthians. He wrote the first Corinthians letter where he excoriated this incestuous person and said, get him out of your church. A little leaven leaven the whole lump. But now he doesn't want to terrify him by letters. Then in verse 10, this is the verse that Alan gave the Thursday night. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Interesting. So that's what they thought of Paul. Uh, his letters are weighty and powerful. But you look at him, he can hardly talk. Uh, <laughs> well, they had a lisp or a stutter or whatever. But he had good letters. So when the Apostle John says, I will not with ink and pen write unto you, he's going to speak later for the next verse face to face. Uh, it depends how we are. But notice in verse 11, 2 Corinthians 10 11, Paul says, let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. Our letters should match our deeds. When we are face to face, what we are in our letters. And sometimes when we're in letters that are bad and good, or better is good and the best person is bad, Paul wanted to be equal things. He wanted to be solid and straight. And not only write good letters, but also in his presence, ought to do that which is right and proper. Uh, there's a little different verses on writing, but this, I have a few of them. Uh, in Proverbs 22, 20, have not I written to thee? I'm glad we got the word of God in writing. Excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee to know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send them to thee. We've got the words of truth in our King James Bible because it follows the proper Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. We have the words of certainty. In John 19, verse 19, Pilate wrote a title, put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He put it in writing. Uh, in fact, one of the messages written by Paul Fedena, one of our early Dean Burgot Society meetings in his church there in Philadelphia, uh, one of his messages and one of his books and pamphlets that he wrote, we have it in writing. It's an interesting title. We have it in writing. The Word of God is in writing. And uh, so he put it in writing in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. And the priests objected, write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate, Pilate answers, we know that one said it to him. What I have written, I have written. We've got to be sure and we have it in the scriptures, very sure indeed. And then in Acts chapter 15 and verse 20, uh, it talks about we, that is Peter and James. We write unto them, and these are the Jews who want to get everybody under the law of Moses. We write unto them just a few things, that we abstain from pollution of idols, that's the first thing. From fornication, it's the second thing. From things strangled, it's the third thing. And from blood. The four things, the only things for the law of Moses, that they are to to perform or not to perform of those four. Then in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 14, I write not these things to shame you. I warn you. The reason he wrote these things to the class of Christians, the Corinthian Christians, was to not to shame them, but to warn them. So writing sometimes does warn us. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. We've got to write proper things to the Lord indeed. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, For this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you. So Paul was a writer. And 2 Corinthians 13 verse 2, I told you and foretold you, if I were present the second time, being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned to all others. He writes. And I'm glad that he was a writer, because otherwise we would not have these 13 or 14 books in the New Testament that Paul was able to write. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent. See, he was absent, but he still could write to these people in these churches in Corinth and so on. And then in Galatians 1, and verse 20. These things which I write unto you, behold, I lie not. 
He's writing again, putting it in writing. You know, a lot of times writing doesn't matter. People don't follow what they write no matter what. Uh, they say, don't just get a verbal contract, put it in writing. But sometimes people even can get out from under their writings. No, they don't get out from under it. They are hypocrites. Sometimes people, let me repeat again, sometimes people get out from under the writings. They go to law and they take it and they completely dismiss the thing and say it's unconstitutional or something else. But Paul says, I write to these things not to be grievous. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 17, the salutation of Paul in mine own hand, which is the token of every epistle, so I write. His own hand, he wrote the whole thing out. Generally, sometimes he had a, a stenographer. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14, these things write I unto thee. So Timothy, hoping to come unto thee shortly. He puts it in writing first, hopes I can see you, but I'm writing to you now. We write all the time in our emails all over the world. People write us, I get almost a thousand a day, sometimes more than a thousand. Mm -hmm. Most of them are, I have to delete because they don't apply, but the people write. They're writing all over the place. I write them back, or maybe a 50 or 100 every day, whatever, but he writes, hoping to see you sometime. Sometimes I write to people, I never see them. Never seen them in all my life. I still write them, and they just won't answer them. Uh, I wrote a man, Prince, he's an evangelist, evangelist Warren Roy. Brother Roy, he's got serious problems. He said, well, what is your interpretation of this verse? He gave me a verse in Proverbs chapter 30. I never noticed the verse before, but he write, never seen it, but he writes back and forth in many things. In 2 Peter 3, in verse 1, Peter says, the second epistle, now I write unto you. He writes the second time, and they didn't get it the first time to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Then in 1 John 1, 4, these things I write unto you. Again, that your joy may be full. He's writing and writing and writing. In 1 John 2, in verse 1, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. He writes. In 1 John 2, again, I write, little children, write unto your fathers and so on. Let's read verse number 14 together. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee, greet the friends by name. So he hopes not only to write now, but Apostle John wants to come and see and visit this church where V.S. was and these others. I don't know whether Demetrius, I'm sure Demetrius will still be there, whether Diotrephes is still there or not, who knows. He wants to come and see them face to face. Now sometimes... When you write, it's different than when you see someone face to face. Yeah. You don't know how they're acting. You don't know what they look like. And uh, sometimes you don't know their character just by what they write. They can write wonderful words, beautiful words, extravagant words, praiseworthy words. But they come to you, they can't stand you. <laughs> sometimes that's true. <laughs> so there's a difference in writing. You can lie through your teeth. Not that you should, but many people lie through their teeth in their writing. They say wonderful things that are false. But when we come face to face, I shortly, Apostle John says, I'm going to be there, not just writing, but I'm going to see you and we will speak face to face. Talking. Not just seeing, but talking. And Exodus 33, verse 11, for example, the Lord spake unto Moses, Face to face. Not that he saw, but it was a face to face. It was a literal, as a man speaketh unto his friend. Mm -hmm. Face to face. No one else. The Lord spoke very loud, loud and other things, but he talked to Moses. Moses was given the whole law, the whole Ten Commandments and the other parts of the law from Mount Sinai. He's there 40 days, 40 nights. And the Lord talked to him. I don't know, he must have talked, and he talked Hebrew to him. I'm sure the Lord knows Hebrew as well as Greek and Spanish and all the other languages of the world. Including Korean, right, Kathy? He knows that. And Chinese. Uh, then in Acts chapter 25, and verse 16, uh, to whom I, that is Paul, answered. He was going to be condemned as a, as a Roman citizen to be scourged and tried. It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver, man, deliver any man to die before that he which is accused had the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. He can answer face to face for himself, and that's what Paul did. They had all kinds of charges against Paul. They couldn't prove them. And Paul was, to use the Latin phrase, pro se, 
for himself. He didn't have a lawyer, didn't need a lawyer, he answered for himself. And that's what this one is, for himself. And Paul had them for himself. First Corinthians 13 <coughs> verse 12, Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. One day we'll see, that if we're generally saved, the Lord face to face. In 2 John 12, it says, I trust to come unto you, this is the one right here, also in 3 John, and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. In 2 John and 3 John, you've got to come to see them face to face. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank thee that we have this third yes. letter of Apostle John, many different things. We do pray, Lord, that thou wouldst not make us as diatrophies, we love it to have the preeminence, to exalt himself, help us to be as Samuel and David said, let the Lord be exalted, and may he be praised and honored in ourselves, in our church, in all that we do. I thank you for Demetrius, who had a good report. Help us, Lord, to have good reports, standing firm, not only between men and among men and people, but also according to thy truth and, and with thee, that we may have uh, te testimonies that are sound and sane. We ask the Lord to continue to bless and use us, take care of us as we leave and May we be faithful to our Savior, those of us who are generally saved. If any are not saved in our service this morning, may they generally trust our Savior, those listening by other means as well. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Take our hymnals again. Hymn number 483. 483. Like a river glorious. Let's say the verse together. Then hath thy peace been as a river. Isaiah 48, 18, 483.